Are you interested in learning more about the history of all things money? Then here are four fascinating stories about the history and evolution of money. Investing and saving today in 2022 is significantly easier compared to how things were 50 years ago. Understanding the history and evolution of the personal finance industry is really important. It helps us appreciate just how far we've come and truly appreciate all the options that are available to us here in 2022. Today, we'll discuss how this evolution occurred over the decades and how we came to where we are today. Welcome back to Nofas Finance. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already for weekly BS free videos. All right, let's get into it. When we think about personal finance and savings, we often think about a sum of money that keeps growing in our bank account. It's not money that we can physically touch or hold. It's a concept that we keep working towards growing. Now, things weren't always like this. Money as a concept started back in 650 BC. Back then, they used coins that were hefty and bulky. The main usage of these coins were to buy things, but the concept of storing or compounding these hefty coins didn't really occur to people back then. The average Joe had a certain number of coins, and they'd use these coins to buy food and get shelter. But that was it. The concept of money was purely survival focused. Fast forward to the 11th century. We now have moved on from these bulky heavy coins to paper money. Now this was a revolution. The idea of being able to buy goods and services utilizing something as functional and lightweight as paper was a game changer. In my research, I couldn't really find concrete evidence for this, but I suspect that the average Joe started thinking more and more about saving during this time. From a purely logistical perspective, this should have been much easier given that paper money barely took any space, it could be easily hidden, it could be carried when people traveled. So I bet around this time, people really started thinking about stashing money away for a rainy day. And I think this is where the concept of saving and investing really started. Since the advent of paper money, things have started progressing quite a bit. Banks, technological advancements, and various other financial instruments have made it easier to store money and invest in personal goods like homes, farms, small businesses, and so on. Now let's fast forward to the last 50 years and we'll start by taking a look at the 1970s. This was the era of the Great Inflation, where prices of all the commodities were much higher than expected. Now in that period, managing personal finance was difficult. The average Joe was mostly concerned about getting through the month. A large part of this was driven by high inflation. Personal finance in this era was mostly defined by financial stability. This meant just having enough to ensure their families were well fed, homed and dressed. The concept of investments or building wealth was mostly for the ultra rich and wealthy and not for the average Joe. When the 80s rolled in, things started to look up slightly. The economic situation started improving and the banking sector as well as the average people started to steer their attention more towards savings and building wealth. Inflation rates dropped during this time and many people started to think about the future. They started to ask themselves how to leave behind wealth and money to the next generation. The banking sector also started to see a big boom during this time and people were more amenable to storing money and investing. And that brings us to the 90s. Now this is where the concept of personal finance took a major turn. People started to think more and more about investing. Investing was not just some alien concept only for the rich and financially savvy. Options to invest in mutual funds, index funds and various other financial instruments started coming in, making it easier for people to start growing their wealth. Now in the 2000s, there were two major things that happened. The first is the internet and the second is economic crises. The internet started booming and with it, the digitization of services and banking features made it such that investing and growing wealth was even more accessible to the average public. But what held a lot of people back were two of the major crises in the 2000s. With global economic crisis comes a fear of investments, of banks, of stocks, and general trust in the financial industry. Now, despite these technological advancements, the 2000s saw fewer people investing in their future through financial products because of this fear. Now we fast forward to the 2010s. People started to slowly get over their fear of investments and financial failures. 
Interest on consumer debts also fell further, which enabled people to profitably utilize their earnings constructively. Banks also took advantage of this eagerness from the public by offering even more services like individual trading platforms, easy access to digital technology, and much more. Now this is where people started to really think about investing in their future. They started to veer more towards business stocks, ETFs, and much more. And today, in the 2020s, things are just on another level. There are numerous apps, platforms, and digital services that enable anyone to access personal financial instruments. If you want to invest in stocks, bonds, all the way to investing in properties or even in the metaverse, things like art and collectibles, it's all there in your fingertips. Credit scores determine a lot in our lives, whether we can apply for loans, whether we can buy a car, whether we can buy a house, or even be eligible for rent. So let's take a look at exactly what a credit score is and how it came to be. Let's start with exactly what a credit score is. A credit score is a three-digit number that is included in a credit report. The score indicates to future lenders how credit worthy you are. In simple terms, that just means the chances of your paying back any borrowed money. Today, your credit score is calculated and reported using a lot of digital technologies and advanced financial calculations. But this wasn't always the case. Back in the day, there really were no actual credit scores for the average Joe. There was, however, commercial credit reporting. Commercial credit reporting was originally used by merchants to evaluate the credit worthiness of potential business customers. In 1841, at least in the US, one of the first agencies to report these commercial scores were established, and it was called the Mercantile Agency. They would have these agents or correspondents whose jobs were to collect information about the lenders and borrowers across the country. In a way, it's quite similar to how credit scores are calculated today. These correspondents would go out and gather information manually. They'd collect information like a business person's marital status, ethnic background, credit history, and age. And they were all entered into this ledger that was centralized in one location in New York. Now, the issue with this was that a lot of the information and evaluations were very subjective. It would depend highly on the correspondents and their worldviews. Now, these agents or correspondents would provide evaluations on people based on their racial background, gender, and moral character. Now, you can imagine just how biased and even racist some of these evaluations could get. Fast forward to the 19th century, and now businesses and mass retailers are starting to see the need for a more individual type of credit rating. This is when the consumer-focused credit ratings really took off. The retailers in question would usually sell items in installments. These would include things like furnitures or other large items. Because these items were relatively more expensive, they'd offer installments, but they would need to verify whether their customers could actually pay them back, and hence the importance of consumer-focused credit scores. And that's exactly how things continued over the next few decades. Consumer credit scores were calculated in a very labor-intensive way with very biased agents or correspondents. But then in the 1960s, things started to become computerized and therefore consolidated. Around 1960, there were over 2,000 credit bureaus all over the country, and their information was all over the place and stored in things like physical papers and cards. It was totally disorganized. So, when computers started gaining popularity, these reports were much better managed. Around the 1980s, the credit bureaus started to consolidate, and a big part of this change was the Fair Isaac Corporation, a data analytics company that was more commonly known as FICO. Now, they saw the need for a simple yet effective way to help the credit bureaus interpret consumers' credit reports. In 1989, FICO worked with national credit bureaus to create a credit scoring model that could be used to evaluate all consumers. This is actually the first time a generalizable credit score was born. And let's fast forward to today. And today in the US, the majority of the businesses and lenders use FICO scores. Now, the way credit scores were calculated back in 1989 has obviously changed and shifted over the years to account for varying consumer behaviors today. So, what actually goes into your credit scores today? According to FICO, there are five factors. The first is payment history, which accounts for 35%, which indicates whether or not you've paid your past credit accounts on time. Next is your amounts owed, which adds up to about 30%. This is the total amount of credit and loans you're currently using compared to your total credit limit. This is also known as your utilization rate. 
Next is the length of your credit history, which accounts for about 15%. This is the length of time you've had credit. And then the next thing is your new credit, which is 10%, which means how often you apply for and open new accounts. And lastly, we have credit mix, which is the last factor and accounts for about 10%. This indicates the variety of credit products you have, which includes credit cards, installment loans, finance company accounts, and mortgage loans. Now, is the credit score a perfect system? I certainly don't think so. It has a lot of gaps and it can be used in discriminatory ways, for example, with people in lower income households or even for new immigrants. In fact, in the US, 26 million Americans are considered to be credit invisible. And it's no surprise that the majority of these people are black, Hispanic and from low income households. Now, if you take a moment to look outside of North America, you'll find that numerous countries do not have a credit scoring system, but they still manage to fund their consumer lending programs effectively. There are a number of effective ways that lenders can do their due diligence instead of relying on a standardized credit rating system that seems to only impact the marginalized communities more. But that's not something that we can change at this moment. So what can you do with this information? My recommendation is this. Understand the history and the evolution of credit scores and try your best to keep a good score. By understanding its history and how it is calculated, you can take more ownership of it and use it in a way that actually favors you. The New York Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange are these behemoth entities facilitating millions of trades and highly complex market functions. But it wasn't always like this. Today, we take these exchanges for granted and the nuances and complexities of how they operate is almost unthinkable. But the truth is, the first stock market started all the way back in the Middle Ages. In this video, we'll talk about how these exchanges came into existence. Let's roll all the way back to the 1300s. It's hard to say this accurately, but the first stock exchange was estimated to be in the 1300s, the late Middle Ages in Italy. It all started with Venetian lenders. They'd actually carry slates with information about various sales and take that information over to potential clients. Think of them as modern day stockbrokers. They'd help facilitate the sales and it was the sale of very simple items but over time, this started to evolve. Soon, these brokers started to introduce the principle of exchanging debts between moneylenders. Things started to become a bit more complex and sophisticated at this point. So here's how things would go down. Let's say moneylender A has a high risk, high interest loan, and moneylender B has a low interest but a long term loan, which is also lower risk. So let's say lender A wants to get rid of his loan, and so the brokers would try to facilitate a deal between lender A and B and try to get them to swap. This pattern of exchanges started to emerge. Soon, these moneylenders would start to buy government debt, sell debt issues to individual investors for a return, and the exchanges helped to facilitate all of this. Then, this started to evolve even further, and the Venetians ended up becoming the leaders in the field and the first to start trading securities from other governments. Fast forward to 1602. That's when the concept of individual corporate stocks started to emerge. Now, this all started with the founding of the Dutch East India Company. Shares or stocks of this company were allowed to be bought by individual investors, all facilitated by exchanges. And then we move on to 1688, and the concept of actually trading one stock for another started to emerge. It's hard to pin down exactly when this happened, but the most accurate record was from a book called Confusion of Confusions, where an American trader called Joseph de la Vega explained the workings of the city stock market. It's the earliest book about stock trading and the inner workings of a stock market that was ever published. The book was curiously written in the form of a dialogue between a merchant, a shareholder, and a philosopher. This book described the market as sophisticated, but also also prone to excesses. De La Vega offered advice to his readers on topics such as the unpredictability of market shifts and the importance of patience in an investment. If he was alive today, he just might have been a YouTuber. What's up you guys? It's great. Exchanges were also places where you could trade or invest in government bonds. Now this all started back in 1693 with King William III in England. England was on its colonization spree and it needed money to fund all of its wars. So the king facilitated the issue of the first ever government bond. Following this, the Bank of England was actually set up. 
The first instances of actual exchanges in England started around 1698, and that's when brokers would meet up in coffee houses with regular lists of stocks and commodity prices. Those lists in discrete coffee houses marked the beginning of the first London Stock Exchange. All right, let's fast forward to 1792. The New York Stock Exchange was opened under a sycamore tree. These trees were also called buttonwood trees. So 24 stockbrokers from New York City signed what's called the Buttonwood Agreement, and they agreed to trade five securities under that tree. What a fascinating way to start off one of the world's largest exchanges. If we take a peek over to Asia, fast forward to 1875, we'll find that the Bombay Stock Exchange was set up. In the 1850s, five stockbrokers gathered under a banyan tree in front of Mumbai Town Hall. A decade later, they moved their operations to a new location, but again under a clutter of banyan trees on what is today called the Mahatma Gandhi Road. I just find it fascinating that these behemoth stock exchanges all have their stars under trees? That's weird. But soon more and more stockbrokers started gathering there, and the Mumbai Stock Exchange operations started to pick up. More and more stock exchanges have then started picking up in different countries, and they've evolved and matured toured into what is the current situation in 2023. It's truly impressive when you take a moment to stop and take a look back and see the humble beginnings of such complex and mature financial institutions that stand tall today. Did you know that Charles Ponzi actually had nothing to do with the first Ponzi scheme? The first Ponzi scheme actually took place all the way back in 1869. While the story of the Ponzi scheme dates back to the 1860s, the scam continues to happen to this day. In this video, we'll explore exactly what a Ponzi scheme is and what you can do to protect yourself. A Ponzi scheme is basically a form of fraud aimed at people who are trying to invest their money and build their wealth. In these schemes, investors are usually lured in with promises of exorbitant returns within a very short period of time, all within in the guise of a legitimate business. Now, in these schemes, the earlier investors can make a profit, but they're unaware that these so-called profits are actually money from other investors. They're not from any legitimate business endeavors. As long as new investors continue to join the scheme and invest, earlier investors can continue to get paid. That is why a Ponzi scheme can end up feeling like a legitimate business. But the one criteria is that the scheme needs to keep on bringing new investors to contribute to that fund. The other criteria is that earlier investors investors need to stay happy with their so-called profits. They must not demand a full repayment of their initial investments. If they do, then the scheme will slowly start to unravel. But as long as they're happy with the so-called profits, and they continue to believe in the non-existent assets they supposedly own in the scheme, then the fraud can continue to exist. The more you think about it, the more you start to realize how this all ends up feeling like a house of cards. It's a delicate balance to keep the scheme running, but it becomes rather unstable if any of the investors start to get wise. So why is it called Ponzi? It started with a man named Charles Ponzi. In the 1920s, Charles carried out this scheme and he became well known in the United States because of the amount of money he could swindle. Charles's Ponzi scheme was based on the legitimate arbitrage of international reply coupons for postage stamps. He basically promised clients a 50% profit within 45 days or a 100% profit within 90 days by buying discounted postal reply coupons in other countries and redeeming them at face value in the US as a form of arbitrage. In reality, Ponzi was paying earlier investors using the investments of later investors. Nowadays, this method of fraud is almost immediately known as a Ponzi scheme. However, this type of fraudulent investment scheme was not actually invented by Ponzi himself. The first type of this kind of fraud was actually discovered back in the 1860s. However, with Charles Ponzi and his postage stamp scheme, the fraud became so famous that people started associating this type of fraud with his name. And today, over a hundred years later, it's still called the Ponzi scheme. Charles's scheme ran for over a year before it collapsed, and it costed investors over $20 million. Now that's a huge chunk of money back in the 1920s. So, since Ponzi schemes are still so prevalent in 2023, how could you identify them? When you are presented with an investment opportunity, there are actually several red flags that you should look out for to see if they are a Ponzi scheme. So here are a few. 
high investment returns with little or no risk. Now, every investment carries some degree of risk and investments yielding higher returns actually involve more risk. So if you're presented with a guaranteed investment opportunity, you should always be suspicious. Overly consistent returns. Now, this probably sounds a bit strange, but when you think about it, investment values tend to go up and down over time, especially the investments that offer high returns. An investment that continues to generate regular positive returns regardless of overall market conditions is a big red flag. Unregistered investments. Ponzi schemes typically involve investments that have not yet been registered with financial regulators. So when you're investing in something, ask for the regulatory approval status and paperwork before joining. Secretive or complex investment strategies. Investments that cannot be understood or on which there is no information that can be found should always be considered suspicious. Difficulty receiving payments. Now investors should also be suspicious in cases where they don't receive a payment or they have difficulty cashing out. Ponzi scheme promoters will often try to prevent participants from cashing out by offering even higher returns for staying inside the fraud. So if you see this, stay away and report it. Now investments these days are pretty straightforward, especially given the vast amount of information and resources available. It's always prudent to equip yourself with the right information and knowledge. But Ponzi schemes are still alive and well, and that's largely due to lack of education or greed for very high returns. The best way to combat this is to learn more and to be aware, but also to keep in mind that anything that's too good to be true is probably untrue. Keep your wits about you and stay vigilant.